we have already uh, discussed this issue of uh, why we do not explicitly store the course ID, because it would be redundant. So, we will move on. So, here is a ER diagram for the university enterprise we are modeling. Now, again this is modeling only a small part of the university, it is a toy, it is not a final thing, but it is uh, model some parts of it fairly uh, comprehensively. So, what are the different entities um, we have? We have departments, students, instructors, um, courses, sections, then we have uh, classrooms, uh, we have a time slot which is uh, useful for the following reason. This could have been an attribute which says this course meets at this time. However, uh, it is useful to model it as an entity um, because uh, then we can say that here is a time slot ID which meets at these times and the course meets in this time slot ID. That is at least how uh, IIT Bombay models it and many other places do the same thing. Uh, they may use different names for the time slot. Um, for example, IIT Bombay uses the name slot 1, slot 2, slot 3. Many places use something like MWF in the US, this is very common, MWF 8 to 9. So, 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but that is they give a name for that. Okay. So, that would be the uh, identifier for the time slot. So, those are the entities and what are the relationships? Uh, we are assuming that every instructor is associated with a department and we have added some constraints also for this in department relationship. This is total, every instructor must have a department and it is also many to one. So, every instructor has at most one department, so it is exactly one department. Now, this of course, rules out an instructor being in multiple departments um, and some universities do allow that, but usually what they do is uh, they require a primary department, you are a member of this. You may also be an adjunct in another department, so that is a common situation. Mostly people do not say you are equally there in two departments. Okay. So, if you want to model an adjunct, then you can have another relationship which is adjunct as opposed to the primary affiliation. Okay. Similarly, for students, um, we have uh, uh, this is a double line and there is an arrow, so it is the same thing. A student is associated with exactly one department. Again, some universities allow multiple uh, majors for a student, um, in which case you would have to modify this schema. Then we have um, course. Now, a course is also associated with a department. Again, course is associated with exactly one department, um, although in some cases there are cross listed courses. This course is the same course can be taken either as a CS course or as an EE course, because both the departments need it. Uh, we are not modeling that situation here. Uh, we would just treat it as two separate courses. And a course has an ID, title, credits, it has prerequisites, we have already seen this. Um, similarly, department has a name which is also the primary key. Now, yesterday somebody was asking me, uh, why do you use department name as identifier here, because it is a long string and uh, it can cause confusion. A more realistic thing would have used some form of identifier, an ID rather than a name. It could be an integer, it could be an abbreviation like CS for comp sci, as opposed to comp dot sci, which we use here. Uh, again, the reason we just stuck to department name was to you know, the more attributes we add, the wider our tables become and the more complex our queries become. So, we have kept the schema a little unrealistically simple, so that uh, it is easier to understand and write queries against it. But in a more realistic schema, certainly we would have had an ID and the department name separately. So, then instructor, uh, of course, the relationship would not have changed, but the relations we create out of it would look different. They would have a department ID instead of a department name that would be the difference. Okay. Uh, we have the advisor relationship as before. Uh, what else is here? Uh, this course to section uh, week um, this, uh, diagram actually has a dash here, but uh, at this scale the dash is not showing up, but it is there in the figure. If you zoomed in on it, you would see it. 
Uh, so, these are the discriminators as before and this section must meet somewhere and the assumption here is that it meets in exactly one classroom. Okay. So, this is again an assumption which is usually true, but occasionally you may say that this course meets here on this day and there on this other day. Uh, that cannot be modeled by this. So, uh, there are some assumptions we are making. Uh, if we remove this arrow, we could certainly allow the section to meet in the in more than one classroom, but then we would not know which time it meets in which classroom. So, then we will have to have uh, another uh, maybe an entity which is time and then uh, that could be a ternary relationship perhaps. So, there are different things you could do, but we have chosen to keep it simple. And again we have uh, each section meets in a particular time slot ID, but the time slot ID actually has a multi valued attribute which indicates when all this particular time slot meets. So, for example, there is a day start and end time. So, time slot 1 for example, in IIT Bombay meets on Monday 8 30 to 9 30, Tuesday 9 30 to 10 30 and Thursday 10 30 to 11 30. So, that is uh, that models that situation. Uh, what else? We have students taking a course, they do not actually take a course what they register for is a section of the course. So, that relationship is between this weak entity section and student and we have an attribute grade associated with it. Of course, initially there is no grade when they register. So, that would have to be null and the grade is assigned at the end of the semester. Uh, no, uh, it is only a uh, course. It is teachers is not an identifying relationship, although it this is totally participates. What this indicates is that every section must be taught by at least one instructor, that is a constraint here. Uh, I do not think, I do not think there is any rule which can stop us uh, entity weak entity becoming being owned by two strong entities. You can certainly, you can have multiple. So, one is this weak entity which is identified by this and by another one. Okay. So, um, let us think of an example of uh, this kind of situation. Um, no, child actually has an identity independent of the mother and the father, even if you do not know who the mother and the father is you can identify the child uniquely. So, that does not quite work. Um, could be just role. No, that, that would not, a role would be optional. So, that whereas, this is existence dependent. Yes, yes. Uh, so, but um, mother child or ch child parent could be roles, just a person entity. Uh, they, yeah. So, person entity may be related to another person. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. By actually, they are two separate relationships, mother and father. Um, so, this uh, I am trying to think of an example. <coughs> Every section is assigned some different classroom, right? Yeah. So, in that section, you do not have the identifier. So, here in, so in that this section, we do not have an uh, primary key, you think? Yes. So, yeah. that section so class is also a weak? Section is weak. In section is the only weak entity in this particular diagram. Right. So, that section class is also weak uh, in uh, the relationship? This one? Huh? Uh, no, no. Uh, relationship can link to a weak entity. That is not a problem. But eventually, how do you identify a section? The right, that is to right identify now. it, you will have to have course ID, section ID, semester year. Uh, so, that is implicitly part of the primary key of section. Okay. So, you so have to copy the primary key. And the issue here was that if a particular weak identity, entity sorry, is mm -hmm. identified by two separate uh, relationships, then the issue is that the primary key, so let us call this k 1 and k 2, this is the primary key here, this is the primary key here. Then the primary key for this would be k 1, k 2 and whatever discriminator, let us say there are two discriminators d 1, d 2. So, for this, th this is the real primary key for this entity set. Uh, in fact, you can have other situations. Um, so, the example which was mentioned earlier. Uh, let us think of this as course. 
this is section now. Let's forget about this part. Let's ignore it. Now, if you merge two institutes, so then there is an institute entity. And now this is no longer a strong entity because the same uh, ID may occur in multiple places. So then a particular course would be identified by the institute. And now this itself becomes a discriminator. And here institute has, um, let's call this. So its primary key is institute ID. So now in this case, what is the primary key of section? Well, the primary key of course itself is institute ID. And uh, th th in this case, this would be course ID. Let's rename K2 to course ID. So the primary key for this would be institute ID, course ID, and then whatever else here. For the section, it is section ID semester year. So you may actually have to complete a path here to get a key primary key for this weak entity. So can you transmute that ID from the multi-valued Okay. So the question is, uh, why don't we simply put time slot as a multi-valued attribute here? Um, so that's a, a good question. Um, it's a design decision. You could have done it that way. Uh, we chose to do it uh, this way because uh, we have a time slot ID. And it may be useful to uh, check, for example, if two uh, courses are running in the same time slot. You can use the time slot ID instead of comparing the day, start time, end time. It's easier to check if there's a clash. Assuming the time slots don't clash, it's enough to check that the uh, you know, if, if a person is registered for two course sections, it's enough to check that their time slot IDs are different. But yes, uh, you know, you could equally well have uh, stuck the multi-value attribute directly in there, and then a little bit more work in the query will get you the same thing. So it's a design decision which could have gone either way. You also lose reuse of the time slot information at multiple places. Sorry? Yeah. Reuse, uh, reusing is lost again if you use as a multi-value attribute. Yes. If you do multi-value attribute, the fact that, you know, in, in, the, in that particular time slot ID, whichever course you use that ID has exactly the same set of things. So that is repeated in everything, uh, every uh, section. Yeah. Um, during normalization? Provided you had a time slot ID, then you would catch it during normalization. Right. If you discarded time slot ID and only had a multi-value attribute, which is um, day, start, and end time, then you wouldn't even catch it at normalization time. Uh, in fact, what will happen there is, uh, if there is no notion of uh, time slots at all, the university says, well, each course can decide when it wants to run, completely independently. Of course, that would result in chaos. <laughs> That's a very bad idea for a university. But if you decided to allow that, uh, then, uh, in fact, there is, uh, no functional dependency here, and normalization would not help in that case. So the fact that we decided that time slot should be structured properly to minimize clashes, every university does this. Uh, so because we have done that, um, we model time slot as an entity. And if we didn't do that, we had time slot ID and day start time in here. Then when you do normalization, you realize that there is a redundancy. And that you can solve by coming back here and splitting it up like this. So instead of just normalizing, this issue was asked before, we could leave the ER diagram as is and just do normalization. Or we could come back and do it right, which makes sense. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Now the next uh, topic is, of course, reducing ER diagrams to relational schemas. So a strong entity set can be converted very simply uh, to a schema, a relational schema with exactly the same attributes and the primary key being a primary key of the relation. This is the first cut. Again, this is going to be refined as you are no doubt familiar. A weak entity set includes a column for the primary key of the identifying strong entity set. 
So, again we are simply we are assuming that this is a strong entity set. Right? If you have a sequence like this, you have to copy the whole thing to get a key for this. So, uh, the primary key for this would be institute ID course ID. And so, the primary key of this thing, identifying entity set would also get copied here. So, that is straightforward. Now, we also have to deal with relationship sets. Um, so, in this case, advisor is modeled as a relation student ID, instructor ID. Um, now, in this case, this is a many to one, actually the, this is, there is a glitch here. Um, since this is many to one, what would the primary key be here? It is many from the student side to one on the instructor side. So, the primary key here would be just student ID. Um, the instructor, yeah, the many side will be the primary key. This should not be there. If this were many to many, then the combination would be the primary key. Now, um, there can be some redundancy in this schema. We can actually simplify it. So, here is um, relationship between instructor and department. So, using the scheme which we just saw, we will have a relation for instructor, a relation for department and one more for instructor department. Now, in this case, we know that an instructor has only one department, at, at most one and in fact, it has exactly one. So, as again you are familiar, when we uh, instead of creating this relation separately, we might as well merge this relation with this relation. The uh, a primary key of this would have been the ID of the instructor, because it is uh, many to one. The primary key for this would also be ID. We might as well merge them instead of keeping them separate, does not really help. And so, what we end up with is department name becomes an attribute of instructor. So, that is the schema we have been using. So, although we started with the relationship, the relationship vanished when we converted to the relational schema. Similarly, student department, department name got copied into student and it vanished. And for advisor, um, if this were in fact uh, many to one, we could have merged advisor into student. Uh, we did not do it in our schema because we did not make this assumption. Advice, well, we do have, uh, what we have done here is that we have not said that student advisor is total. So, now we could merge um, advisor as an attribute of student, the instructor ID in here. The issue will be that it will be null for all students who do not have an advisor. So, we do not want to unnecessarily create null values in the database. Therefore, we keep the relationship separate. Okay. So, we are going to do this merging only if uh, it is many to one and total. If it is just many to one, we are not going to merge it. So, this was the point about total. So, if the participation is partial on the many side, replacing a schema by an extra attribute could result in null value. So, we do not do it. Uh, finally, the schema corresponding to this identifying relationship here from the weak entity set to the identifying strong entity set is guaranteed to be redundant when we convert it to a relational schema. Why? Because when we create a schema for this guy, we have to copy the primary key from this side in here. So, that is already part of this. So, for section, uh, for the section relation, course ID has to be present in the section relation by our uh, previous construction. Uh, where was that? Here. Course ID is part of this. So, now what will be the attributes of the relationship section course we created it? It is going to be um, you know the primary key from this side and from this side which is course ID and from this side um, you know course ID section ID semester here, but that is the same thing it is redundant. So, it is equivalent to have pulled this into this side. So, just like we merged uh, certain relations ships into the entity, the identifying thing will be merged into this automatically because of this step. So, we do not even have to bother to explicitly get rid of it with that redundancy here. Uh, 
Okay, so that was for um, the simple attributes. What about um, the more complex uh, composite and multi-valued attributes? Uh, what do we do? So, composite attributes can be dealt with by simply flattening them. Um, for example, here um, we convert it into a relation with id, first name, middle initial, last name. If there is any ambiguity, if the same thing appears here also, for example, then we would have to be uh, careful and call it name underscore first name, name underscore middle initial, so that it is clear where it, uh, there is no uh, duplication address, everything got flattened. So, composite attributes can very easily be flattened, if you wish. Of course, that means uh, you are losing some flexibility. If, if you had an object relational system, which actually allowed composite attributes in a relation, then the benefit is that we can refer to instructor dot name and automatically get all three components. You do not have to write a query, which separately says first name, middle initial, last name. So, if the system supports it, we could avoid this flattening and keep the same structure. If it does not, then we do this. Okay. Now, what about um, the multi-valued attribute here? You will notice it does not appear over here, phone number. That has to be kept separate, because it is not atomic. There is a question from my side. Uh, you said that you can flatten the structure by just separating out first name, middle name, last name or something of that sort. Yeah. Uh, but then, does it mean that while designing an ER model, you should have in mind what kind of queries will be there for my database? Uh, so, the point of the flattening is that this flattening happens only because the relational model does not support structured things. Uh, so, when you are doing the ER model, you do not want to worry about whether your final database supports it or not. Uh, it is better to have something which is conceptually meaningful. The name is conceptually meaningful, and it also is conceptually meaningful to break up the name into parts. So, you should be doing it that way when you are doing the ER model, not worry about the implementation. But now, we have to worry about the implementation, and if it does not support composite attributes, we flatten. That is basically a separation of concerns. There is a higher level conceptual thing at the ER modeling, and then we get down to nitty gritty when we there is actually other way of saying it. Mm -hmm. If if you are going to question the structure of that composite mm -hmm. uh, attribute, in the sense you are going to have a query on the structure of the attribute, then you there it makes sense to flatten it. Otherwise, just represent it as a simple attribute, which is name of maybe uh, fifty okay. characters. So you are saying uh, combine these first name, middle initial, last exactly. name into a single string. Exactly. Um, yeah. The, you can do that only if you are sure that you will never need to query the independent parts. So, we are not making that assumption. So, we are keeping them separate. Here, of course, it makes sense to keep it separate, but yeah. there may be some situations where you sure. are not sure whether you should look at the structure of the that name or whatever is that composite you, uh, yeah. attribute. So, but you could have done it also at the ER diagram itself. You Instead of breaking up the structure there, you could have just made it a flat name and then the mapping will be straightforward. So, if, if you were sure you did not want the parts of it, you might as well have done it in the ER notation. So, is it revealed at some point when you actually execute the queries, that you need to have a composite attribute? Mm, you mean? Or something of that. So, I am not sure what you mean by that. So, so when, when you run the queries for your yeah. database, so yeah. does at any point, uh, any point of time, you have any way of evaluating that, okay, these are the frequent queries. So, let me go back and represent the structure of this attribute in the sense, uh -uh, first name, middle name, last name kind of thing. In the initial design, you just kept these as three separate things. And so, now do you we analyze these Most things. queries want all three together. Therefore, you should have combined them by creating a structure. Uh, yes, uh, that is also possible. Although, uh, typically, the queries are going to reflect the semantic notions and that semantics is already available when you did the ER diagram, even though you never looked at the queries. So, I am not sure you would look at the queries and come back, but yeah. it is possible in some situations. Yeah. You never look at the query and design an ER model or an uh, relation model. So, just for a generalized thing, you cannot look at yeah. the query and go back and refine the ER model or an relation model. Yeah, typically, that yeah, is true. That flattening can be done at the higher level itself or can be done in an relation model. That 
independent depends on the view of an yeah typically uh, you should not depend on the query because the queries may get added or yeah, removed any kind of so queries can be on it yes yes okay. so multi, what about multi valued attributes again the representation is straightforward uh, we create a new relation containing the primary key of the um, entity if it were a weak entity its primary key is really a composite key so we need its primary key followed by the um, attribute here whatever was the parts of the multi valued attribute in this case phone number was the multi valued attribute so we get that now if you apply this to time slot id what are we going to get this is a multi valued attribute so we are going to get a uh, relation time slot with just time slot id you will get two relations i have not shown it here uh, but you are going to get two relations one is time slot with time slot id and no other attribute because the only remaining attribute is multi value and then we'll get a time slot um let's say times give it some name with this thing time slot id uh, day start time and end time so this relation we would actually get two relations time slot and then this one with we would have to give some other name now if you look at this pair of relation this guy does not have anything it just has a single time slot it could still be useful uh, why is it useful because section um has a time slot id so um when we create the relation corresponding to section time slot id is going to be in there and in the relational schema you would have a foreign key from a uh, time slot id to this time slot id because here that's a primary key so you could have a foreign key into this relation in addition you have one more relation which is time slot times with uh, all of these time slot id and its primary key is really a combination day start time and end time note that end time is not part of the primary key it would be a super key but i think it's safe to assume that if it starts at a particular time on a particular day it cannot end at two different times it's semantically meaningless therefore end time is not part of the primary key there and of uh, this would be a foreign key referencing that and similarly from section there would be a time slot id which is in turn a foreign key referencing that that would be the relational schema now in our design we chose to do away with that, that intermediate relation it doesn't serve too much of Uh, purpose the only benefit it gives us we can have the foreign key um but we chose to remove one relation and keep this so the price we pay is that this can no longer be a foreign key anywhere because time slot id is not the primary key of this the primary key involves multiple attributes so we just chose this um to illustrate what would happen if you got rid of that relation and we reduce the number of relations so what we lost the ability to have a foreign key but queries are uh, simple enough because we can directly join section with uh, our time slot now we rename this relation since we got rid of that relation we renamed this relation itself to time slot so that is the university schema which we have okay so the question is when we are doing the er diagram do we have to worry about the queries uh, typically no we are trying to model an enterprise what are the uh, what data do we need to store queries are a separate concern which we will worry about later we can't worry about all of them at once uh, and typically there is your query is not going to change your model typically there are some exceptions uh, which actually don't happen at the er level but happen at the relational level where uh, you may decide to uh, keep something separate or merge some schemas from an efficiency view point 
taking into account what are common queries. So, uh, that part of normalization for performance takes queries into account, but usually at the ER level we try not to do that because it just confuses the picture. Okay, we are almost uh, out of time um, for this session. We have another 10 minutes. So I'll quickly go over uh, these other two uh, aspects, of which specialization generalization is very important. Aggregation is less important. Uh, it's not. Hmm? Okay. So uh, what we have is specialization. Again, you're no doubt familiar with this. It occurs in object-oriented design all the time. Inheritance. So I won't spend too much time on this. Um, but this is actually a very, very useful feature in ER modeling. It have, we have already saw an example yesterday, I think you had mentioned it, uh, about uh, this library where you have multiple users, students and faculty and maybe external users. So in this case, we have person who is an employee or student and an employee could be instructor or secretary. Uh, just uh, this notation is modeled after uh, the UML notation. Um, which is basically identical using this triangle. Uh, the only difference is that uh, the constraints on this in UML have to be stated explicitly. Uh, we adopt this thing where if we have a common thing which then bifurcates like this, then that is a disjoint thing, uh, then specialization. Whereas if we do this directly, then it could be overlapping. So, which means an employee could also be a student. Okay, so, other than that, it's just standard. In UML, uh, or, or if you want to avoid confusion, um, where is that? Yeah. So, we could explicitly say total uh, specialized. So, th th there's two other notions. Uh, there's a notion of total or partial. Total means that this guy has to belong to one of these. So, you cannot have a person who is neither an employee nor a student. Every person must be one of these two. Partial on the other hand means that you can have a person who is neither. So, in our notation, if you do not say total here, the default is partial. So, you can have a person who is not a, uh, either a student or a instructor, but if you do say total, then it has to be total. Um, and if you uh, want to make it explicit that this is disjoint or overlapping, you could explicitly say it disjoint over here. Okay, so, that can make it uh, unambiguous with respect to the standard UML notation. Can I ask you one question? Yeah. If you are saying that that mm. participation is, uh, that, that the hierarchy is total. Yeah, the, uh, not if just you this point in the hierarchy. Uh, it is total means E one is completely classified into either E two or E three or Correct. both of them, right? Correct. So if such situation is there, then are you because practically we come across the situations where yeah. uh, by creating the hierarchy we are actually looking at exploiting the extendability of this ER model. So if yeah. you are uh, very sure, then only you can go ahead and say that it is total. Yeah. But then the future extensions are closed actually. You are right. So, any constraints which you add like this, uh, th that itself is a design process. Should you have this constraint or not? Um, and it has a very major impact um, for the following reason. Take a simpler constraint, which is, uh, you know, is this, is this many to many or many to one? Now, if you said that this is many to one, you are allowing the relational uh, design to pull an attribute into a relation. Okay, so, a uh, student has a department name. Now, tomorrow if your requirement changes and you say, uh, well, I uh, change my decision, I am going to allow a student to be in two departments, equally in two departments. Now, you are in trouble. You have to go and change the relational schema, which means you have to change all the queries. It is a huge impact on the application. So, you should not throw in constraints just like that, because, uh, you know, even if they hold today, if you feel that they may not hold tomorrow, it may change, you should probably not throw in the constraint at the schema level. You may throw in the constraint at the application level. Maybe the application can check that, you know, this does not happen. Or you may create a schema which is flexible in the relational schema, which allows uh, the constraint to be enforced or not. 
and then you add the constraint explicitly on the relational schema, but you can drop it later. If that no longer holds, you can drop the constraint without making any other change in the relational schema. So, that is very important because this is something which people tend to neglect. They will throw in any constraint they want which happens to hold and then hardwire the schema so tightly that change later is becomes very, very hard. So, you have to future proof the design in this sense. So, where are we? Yeah, specialization. Uh, so, this is the ER diagram. How do you convert it to tables? Again, you are probably familiar with this. Um, assuming that uh, the uh, specialization is not total, uh, we would create a table for each of these, but you have a choice of what attributes these tables contain. Um, well, this is the constraints. Uh, okay, so, let us finish the constraints first. Um, so, this constraint on whether entities uh, can be members of a lower level thing could be condition or user defined. This is not used very much, we will uh, skip it. This says whether it is disjoint specialization or overlapping, we have just seen an example. And then we have total versus partial, again we saw the example. So, now taking these constraints into account, how do we do the uh, relational uh, schema from this? So, here we had person, student and employee. So, in this method 1, each of these has the primary key, which is inherited from the top one. So, note that I d is the primary key, which appears here. It does not appear down here. So, in a specialization, you should not be copying the primary key down, because you are implicitly inheriting all the attributes from above. So, you should not again list it here. That is a mistake. So, given that you are inheriting everything, that does not mean you have to copy everything down into the schema. So, one option is to copy only the primary key down and if you have a student, there would also be a row in the person table to record that student's name, street and city and similarly for an employee, there would be a record there. This makes a lot of sense in particular if the specialization is overlapping. If somebody is a student and an employee, there is no problem at all here. You would keep their name, street, uh, city once here and then you would also have extra rows which says that this person is a student and this person is an employee. But then when you want to get information, you have to do a join. That is the drawback. The other option is you copy all the attributes down. So, name, street, city have been copied into both student and employee. This makes more sense if the uh, specialization is non-overlapping. So, you cannot have somebody who is a student and an employee, then this is okay. Uh, so, you would um, each uh, entity would either be a person, a student or an employee. And further on more, if the uh, specialization is total, every person must be a student or an employee, you can even get rid of this table person table. Okay. Now, there are some ways of doing this. Now, if you, if you had um, something which could relate to either a student or an employee, there is a relationship to this. It, you could create a relationship to person, that is what you would do. But if you get rid of the person table, what do you refer to? And furthermore, with this representation, uh, if somebody is a student, we will not represent them as person. There would only be a record in the student table, not a record in the person table. Okay. So, from that viewpoint, this representation makes more sense, because you can um, have a foreign key referencing this table. Uh, so, in the library case, um, you would have a foreign key referencing the person table and for every student and employee, there would be a row in the person table. So, this is actually a cleaner design. And you would do this only if you are sure that certain things will not be required. Okay, so, that uh, wraps up pretty much our ER thing and that is it for this chapter.